one of the things you saw with both presidents Bush and Obama was they had sort of an instinctive feel and an evolved way of trying to get through one of the most, I think, vexing things about being a leader, particularly a really senior leader, which is that nobody wants to tell you the truth. And it's really hard for leaders to find people who are willing to tell them when they've got food stuck in their tooth or when they're doing something stupid. Welcome to Roll Right In, a podcast in which we explore the success strategies of thriving entrepreneurs and leaders. We believe the big challenges in this world can only be solved by the courageous. Like our guest, international top leadership expert, Jeff Eggers. Thanks, Alec. Uh, Fabian, good to see you again. Uh, great to be with you. I'm looking forward to it. Jeff is based in Washington, D.C. He served in the White House for six years as President Obama's Special Advisor for National Security Affairs. Before that, Jeff spent 20 years as a U.S. Navy SEAL and held various leadership positions, including the commander of the Special Operations Task Unit in Western Iraq, an operations officer and mission commander for the U.S. Navy's Undersea Special Operations Command. Later, Jeff became the Executive Director of McChrystal Group's Leadership Institute a leadership consultancy firm aimed at improving organizational performance. He co-authored the best-selling book Leaders, Myth and Reality and worked as an executive coach for high-ranking leaders globally. Recently, he is the managing partner and co-founder of Risk and Return, a philanthropic venture fund focused on accelerating solutions and technologies for high-risk public servants. So, Jeff, you have been all around the world on military missions. You have been promoted so many times. You have borne great responsibilities for many, many people. So what is your most important leadership principle, your main takeaway? In Iraq, we were going after this sort of high level, uh, you know, uh, insurgent leader who was reported to be doing all these crazy things to evade our efforts to find him, to include like dressing up as women, hiding in the back of garbage trucks, you know, to evade checkpoints and all this, all this kind of crazy behavior. And so it was a little bit of a cat and mouse game to try and find him. And one night we got some intel that he was sleeping in this farm, but there was no way he wasn't going to have early detection systems out on every road going into that farm. So there, there were, and, and helicopters were just too loud, right? You couldn't get the element of surprise. So we were going to, we decided we were going to sneak in the way that he would least expect that we were going to come in uh, with a very light footprint with the smallest trucks we had through the back of the farm, right? And, and catch him by surprise. Well, one of the things you couldn't see on the imagery was that the farm was actually a flooded uh, set of fields that were separated by these massive like 20 foot berms that were only like 10 feet wide on the top. And as we're driving up across the top of this berm, trying to sneak into the back of the farm, um, you could tell it was like getting narrower and narrower and narrower. And then before we knew it, um, the gun truck that was I, I was in just sort of like the, the berm gave way, collapsed underneath us, and the whole truck rolled into the, the ditch. Um, and it wasn't a big deal. Nobody was hurt, but the gig was up. Like, we, the, the element of surprise was lost. It was a big mess. And and I remember having a chat with my senior enlisted advisor, this guy, Pete Nazchek, who's, who's uh, one of the most uh, gifted leaders I had a chance to work with. And we were sitting there having this debate on top of the berm about how we were going to get the truck out of the ditch and get home that night. And I was like, look, man, I'm an engineer. Like I know how much that truck weighs and we need to call on the army to bring in one of those big heavy wreckers. And he's like, no, 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 no. We've got some of those big ropes. We've got 20 very strong men right here. We'll attach the rope, we'll pull it over. We'll get out of here. I'll have us out of here in no time. And I looked at him and I said, look, I know physics, I know engineering. I know you can't do that. Like there's no way that's gonna happen. 
And he goes, let me give it a shot. And I went, okay, I'm going to go get on the radio and call the army to bring a record here. <laughs> and by the time I had the army kind of answering our calls on the radio, no kidding, he had the 20 guys on the rope actually flipping the two-ton gun truck or whatever it was back onto its wheels. And before I knew it, I was watching this flooded, upside-down, previously upside-down gun truck, like mud bogging through the field, and they got it out of there. And I was, I was categorically wrong about the physics and what was possible. And if I had just, in the first instance, listened to Pete and said, you got it, I would have been much better off. And so I, you know, through a number of those types of mistakes, I, you know, came to the, the position where your job is not to uh, think too much. It's really to think about what they need and what they're telling you. Um, and that's true to different degrees for different kinds of teams. But for that kind of team in that moment, um, it was a very clear lesson uh, to refer to the, the experience and the collective intelligence of the group. How do you make sure that the team keeps cool in such, such situations? Well, to be honest with you, Fabian, that situation wasn't a big deal. Like, um, you know, how do you keep cool under really high pressure situations is, I think, something all of us struggle with, frankly, and can do better at. In our case, I'll be honest with you, in our case, I think it was mostly a matter of conditioning. And that is not only my personal experience, but it's my understanding of sort of the research and the literature at this point is that exposure, you know, repeated exposure, i.e. conditioning, is one of the best ways to manage stress, uh, stress and pressure. Um, there's actually been some studies done where they do fMRI imaging of the brain um, and then expose people to different kind of uh, stressful stimuli and so forth. And one of the things you find is that people who um, have had repeated exposure do better at kind of being more moderated when exposed to stressful situations. So like it or not, one of the best ways to do it is to practice. Um, mm -hmm. And we literally used to do things called um, the hood drill. And I will never forget the hood drill because it was extremely painful. But you would you would stand in the middle of a room. Um, and there would be a black hood that would be lowered over your head attached to the ceiling with a rope. And then um, a combat scenario would be constructed around you while you were just sitting there with the hood over your head. And the idea was that somebody would pull the rope and the hood would go up and then the scenario would be on. In a millisecond, you had to decide how you were going to react to that scenario. Are you going to ratchet up your use of force because it's a very threatening life or death scenario? Or are you going to just take stock of the situation, evaluate, consider your options, and then proceed, right? Um, and, and deliberately, the scenarios were unpredictable. They would go back and forth, and you, could, you never knew which scenario you were going to get. So you truly had to try and be right on the edge of escalating immediately to life and death use of force or de-escalating to, okay, think observe, evaluate my options. And I remember I would always get it wrong. Like the hood would go up and the scenario would be like <laughs> some, some old person asking for directions and I would like clock them or shoot them or whatever I was supposed to, it, I would do the opposite, right? And then the hood would go up and it would be like 10 armed men about to, you know, take me down and I would react slowly and then it was, it was a mess. So I learned very painfully, right? Like that, um, that I wasn't very good at finding that edge, but that, those are the types of exercises we would do to get one in the habit of not being automatically reflexive in one direction or the other. Because um, it, it, it is true that in those situations, you needed teams where they would go into the building or into a room and there would be a person on the other side. And that could be a teammate. It could be the enemy, or it could be some innocent something else, right? And your ability to differentiate those could mean the difference between you dying or you accidentally killing someone who was innocent or worse, your teammate. So 
that's an incredibly valuable skill for obvious reasons in, in that profession. But it's, I mean, to varying degrees, that's true for all of us, right? In everyday life, whether it's in our personal relationships, our work relationships or whatnot. You said that being exposed to this situation is one thing. But I heard you repeating this uh, framework, like observe, think, and then kind of thinking about the options, I guess. So it's this split second where you have to evaluate the situation to then make a decision, if I heard you correctly. Um, how, can you, how can you practice for this brief split second where you have to make that decision? Is there a framework that you follow? Or do you just get exposed to it over and over again and you just naturally get better in it? There's a, there's a classic framework that did come from the military, from the aviation part of the military, um, that, that many people use both in the military and elsewhere, and it's become quite famous, of the OODA loop, um, that you, you, you know, go through this cycle. And you have to kind of go through the cycle continuously because it's a dynamic environment, right? It, you don't go through the cycle once because by the time you've gone through the cycle once, the situation has evolved and changed and therefore you just continue going through the cycle. And it's called the OODA loop as an acronym for the, the four letters of um, observe, orient, decide, and act. Um, and I think the critical, the critical part of that is, is really the front part that most of us skip past. Um, the, the ability to kind of take in and 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 for most of us it's not always about observing because it don't forget this is this came from fighter pilots who are literally like looking out the windshield for most of us it really if we if we modified it in, in our context it would be more about listen rather than observe because very often mm -hmm. whether it's a meeting or a phone call yes there's something you're seeing but mo more often it's something you're hearing and, you know, I think that's why one of the best lessons for all of us, but particularly for leaders, is to listen more and talk less. And if you're going to talk, ask questions and then go back to listening. Because mm -hmm. that's, that's the part of that cycle that gets neglected and, and in really ways is, is where you get off on the wrong foot if you skip. Mm -hmm. How um, do you make this selection? How do you recruit the right people? You, how do you make sure that you have the right people on your team? I, you know, I think there's a tendency to want to work with people that you get along with, you enjoy spending time with, and there's good reasons for that. And, and it's natural and it, and it does serve um, some benefit. And it's a natural human instinct, right? We all, we all do that. Um, I actually think that, that you have to kind of deliberately counter that tendency with pulling in as much cognitive diversity um, as possible. And often the way you're gonna find that is social diversity. You're gonna find people who think differently if they're from a, a different walk of life and so forth. Um, you know, I'll never forget that one of the, one of the guys going through training, um, you know, back, in, in my early military days, who was always on the cutting block. He was always on the chopping block because he couldn't run that fast, right? Like, and, and a lot of the standards for making those teams were built around how many pull-ups could you do? How fast could you run? How fast could you swim? How fast could you do the obstacle course? And this guy was always, you know, barely making the standards. And he was, he was, um, very lucky to, to graduate, but he graduated because not because he met the standards, but because he had a heart of gold and he, he had the right attitude. Right. And he couldn't run because he was a big guy. He was huge. Um, and later down the road, when we got into the actual work of doing special operation stuff, not once were we ever in a situation where it mattered how fast we could run. But very often we were in a situation where we would turn to this guy. His name was Bostic. And he could carry any amount of weight over any <laughs> obstacle, right? And so we were very, very lucky to have him on the team. But the standards by which we were selecting for were, 
were in a very different place. So it, it was an early lesson that you really need to kind of open the aperture and bring in as much diversity. Now, fast forward to the, the world most of us live in. Um, you know, what we know is that teams that have the most cognitive diversity are going to be the highest performing. That's just true. And one of the ways that manifests most often is in gender diversity. Um, Would you? There's a lot of... Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Fabio. Sorry for interrupting. Um, would you take uh, Ole me on your team? Please don't give the wrong answer now. <laughs> we are on the team. What are you talking about? What are you guys saying? I thought you were on the team. I thought that was the next chapter. Um, you know I'm in a different line of work right now, uh, and I'm, I'm doing philanthropic early-stage venture capital, but uh, by, by all means, Fabian, uh, the, the invitation is open. Let's do it. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. What we were talking about um, cognitive diversity. Um, what do you mean by that? Well, you want, and I just I just got off a, a call with somebody who's doing some research on this um, about how much of organizational output comes from individual effort versus team collaboration and what's the right amount of team collaboration. And there's no question that you need some amount of team collaboration. And really what you're looking for is collision of ideas, right? And you're looking for collision of different ideas. And so you, you really have to think about how do you optimally construct a team and a system where you're going to get the right kind of collision of, of as many different ideas as possible. So I think why cognitive diversity is important is because that, you know, it brings in perspective variation, right? Like, and, and all of us live with our own ideas all the time. And we, we kid ourselves about how much cognitive diversity we're able to bring to a situation. Like we say to ourselves, oh, I'm going to think differently. I'm going to, I'm going to come up with three different options, but the, the, you know, the space between your three different options is like this. You're just, you're really, you're really much more confined than you understand. And the only way you're going to open that aperture is by bringing in people with different perspectives. And, and the way that's going to happen the best is if those people are coming from different walks of life, right, um, in different parts of social diversity. We give a lot of emphasis to things like gender and ethnicity and so forth. One of the more interesting ones, I think, in this day and age that we're all sort of dealing with is, is generational or age. Uh, there are huge differences in the way people from different age, ages and generations, um, you know, see the world right now. And that's a, that can be a great well of opportunity, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, one more question. What, what's the role of trust in this? Because I guess if you are of opposing um, opinion with one topic that you're trying to make a decision on, um, trust is a key factor to let this other perspective really thrive. Yeah, no, and I think, I think trust is talked about a lot and understood very little. I think it's one of those things that, you know, you throw around the importance of trust in, in high performing teams and so forth. Um, but it, you, it, one, it's very, it's very difficult to build. It's not clear how you build it, but two, it's not clear to everyone when they're throwing that around why it's important. And I think, I actually think the reason is pretty simple. Um, you, you do well by empowering a team to sort of act somewhat autonomously, right? Yes, you need to collaborate. Yes, you need to come together. But yes, you also need a lot of independent and autonomous action because that's how you go fast. That's how you generate motivation. That's how you generate creativity and so forth. But it's scary to decentralized, right? It's scary to empower people. Um, it's a huge leap of faith. And one of the best ways to kind of jump over to make that leap is with trust. The more you trust someone, the more you're willing to sort of throw the keys, right? And say, you know, take the car, have at it. Um, that's a lot easier when you, when you have trust. I think that's the, the simple, easy part. Um, I think the hard part is how do you get it? Where does trust come from? And I think the cruel reality is that it takes a long time to build. It takes very little time to destroy. Um, and that's why you have to kind of like pay attention to it because 
I, I don't think there's any uh, shortcuts around that, unfortunately. But are there any factors that you think are important? For building for trust, you mean? Yes. Yes. One of the, I think one of the best, and, and it, it sounds like I'm going to contradict myself, and I am, I guess, a little bit, because I'm, I'm going to say there's <laughs> something of a shortcut, and that is um, shared hardship. I, you know, time together can build trust, right? Uh, familiarity can build trust. But I think one of the best ways is, is shared hardship. If you go through a really stressful, difficult, um, nausea-inducing scenario together and you come out the other end, it just accelerates the process. Um, and that's hard to engineer. You know, how do you, if you believe that's true, then what are you going to do? Like take your team out and go like jump in like a life and death, you know, stressful situation together. It's hard to do. Um, but to the extent you could do something approximating that, or to the extent you can find ways to, to spend more time in, in situations that approximate that, I think you can accelerate the process a bit. Fabian, do you have a question, a follow-up question, or should I just jump in? I don't want to exclude you from this conversation. Yeah, I was wondering, but I missed that one in the beginning, namely, um, so you, when you're a teenager, there's a certain point where you find out that you want to become, or you want to go to the army, or you want to become a pilot, or you want to try to become a pilot, or you want to become a Navy SEAL. When happened that to you, you know, why, why did you come to this decision that you sacrifice then finally 20 years of your life as a Navy SEAL? Well, it didn't start that way. I, I grew up the son of an Air Force officer and spent my childhood in the shadow of aircraft. So I, for a long time, said I'm going to, you know, fly fighter jets and so forth. Um, and that was the goal. That was the childhood dream. And then I went to the U.S. Naval Academy. And in the first year, I sort of got this very abrupt wake-up call that the real point of being a military officer was not about operating technical machinery. It was about leading humans being part of, uh, you know, that enterprise of, of human leadership. And then I looked around at pilots and no offense to pilots. I love pilots. I love aircraft. I still love flying, but I looked around at that and I said, you know, there isn't a lot of leadership in the cockpit of a single seat aircraft. And then I stumbled into this community that I never heard of growing up in, in the special operations world. And I looked at it and I said, now there is a team dynamic. There is a leadership opportunity. And by the way, they're doing some pretty interesting things. So I'm going to go in that direction instead. And I sort of gave up the childhood dream. I think the, and I've continued to relearn that lesson, right? Like we all do, which is that the best opportunity for you maybe one you haven't really thought of or you don't even know exists. So how do you, how do you increase your exposure to everything that's potentially out there? Um, and all of us are shaped by where we came from, right? And so we, if we don't force ourselves to sort of revisit all of that shaping and assumptions that happen because of where we came from, you sort of, you might miss out on those opportunities. And that, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Like if you're the son of an Air Force officer, yeah, you're going to maybe grow up wanting to fly. Um, but I'm sort of grateful for the fact that I got bumped off of that path and got exposed to some new stuff. So when you started your career, would you have ever thought that you would end up as, a, as an advisor to the president of the United States? No. No, no, no. <laughs> no. And it was, it was, to be honest with you, it was a complete accident of history. Um, I mean, it's just one of those quirks of life. It's not, 
it's not something I ever set out to do. It's not something that I was looking for. It's something, and I look, I don't, I don't admit this with a lot of pride because I think, I think we should be shapers of our destiny. I would like to think that anyway. And in this part of my life, I wasn't, I just wasn't. I was sort of along for the ride and I was sort of, and this, this is the way the military works, by the way, is the military doesn't give you a lot of say in what you're going to go do. Right. Um, that's just the nature of it. And so you, you do get kind of told, Hey, you're going to this job, you're going to this job. And in my case, I was just, I kept getting told you're going here, you're going there. And I kept walking into this, the wrong room or making a left when I should have gone right and ended up in these, these situations or these jobs or these experiences that I never anticipated, but were quite rewarding, but completely reshaped the, the trajectory of my, my life in ways that I never, never would have expected. So no, I believe me, I had zero expectation or, or uh, plan to ever end up in those types of jobs. So first you um, started in Washington uh, in several offices, um, also as a chief for combating terrorism uh, at the joint staff. Somehow you made something right because then you were called by the president himself, Barack Obama. How, what happened that Barack Obama came across your name? I, I told you it was an accident of history. It was it was literally. I don't believe you, so. I, I will don't tell you so. the story, Fabi. I will tell you the story. So, so Obama is just hiring people, just right hand people. No, it's, it was it was it was it was one accident on top of another accident, and I'll tell you the story really quickly. So, the first trip to the White House was under President Bush, um, and. That was the job you're speaking of. And so that was sort of early in the post 9 11 environment. I was working on counterterrorism issues and so forth. And then I went back to the military, back to the Pentagon. And then I went to Afghanistan and I was working for General McChrystal. Um, and I swore at that point, I had sworn I'm never going back to that White House place because it was, it was, I mean, it was difficult work. It was very stressful, very long days. I was like, that was interesting. Did it once. Don't need to do it again. And I was very, I was actually very like in a good place working for General McChrystal in Afghanistan, enjoyed it, was enjoying my job there. Um, when for um, now kind of well understood reasons, General McChrystal resigned because of an article that uh, was published that Rolling Stones, right? The Rolling Stone article. So the Rolling Stone article was done by a journalist who did a series of interviews on one trip the general did. And that was a trip he took to Europe for some NATO stuff in Europe. And so all of the, the stuff in that article came from that one trip. That was the only trip I didn't go on with the general. It was the only trip I didn't go on. And the reason was because a friend of mine who was a battalion commander up in the Pesh River Valley, which is this really mountainous, crazy rugged part of Afghanistan that I'd always wanted to see invited me to come like hang out with them. And so I, I said, Hey, you guys go on the trip. You've got this covered. I'm going to go see my friend up in the corner of Afghanistan. So I didn't go on the trip to Europe. So fast forward, General McChrystal resigns and I'm out of a job, right? General Petraeus briefly entertained the idea that maybe I would stay on with his staff but I met with General Petraeus. We talked for a little while. He's like, nah, go back, go back, go back to DC. So I come home, I'm out of a job and my wife was pregnant. Uh, uh, and we're sitting around and actually, no, no, no hold on. She was, she just had the baby. So I had a newborn daughter. We're sitting around and, and my wife's like, what are you going to do? I was like, I don't know. I, I, I don't have a job. She's like, why don't you go buy some diapers? Why don't you, I could use you, I could use some new diapers. We're, we're out. Why don't you stop at the store? So I, I did some errands I and mean, we took some time off. We actually went on a little trip uh, to Colorado together because I literally was out of a job. So 
while we're in Colorado, the phone rings and it's, and it's a guy I knew from my previous stint at the White House that I had met there. And he's like, Hey, how you doing? I was like, eh, been better. He's like, I hear you're out of a job. I was like, yep. And he's like, well, would you want to come back to work at the White House again? And I said, wait a second. General Crystal just resigned because of things that the White House was unhappy about in this article. And those things were done by his staff and I was on his staff. Why would you want me to come work there? And he said, well, if you weren't on that trip to Europe, then I don't think it'll be a problem. Nobody will care because you weren't on the trip. And it just so happened that that was the one trip I didn't go on. Um, so I told him, hey, I wasn't on the trip. He said, well, then we could probably hire you. So I went back to work at the White House a second time, completely unexpectedly, mostly because they called because they knew I was out of a job suddenly. And then one thing led to another and, and the rest is history. But I, I look, I did not plan that. Uh, I could not have foreseen that. And, and this is the way life goes sometimes, right? What so some let's of the... talk about, sorry. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. ahead. I think we want to say the same thing. Namely, let's talk about Obama. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's true. What time, does he, what time does he get up? I have no idea. Okay. What, did, know. what does he eat for breakfast? Bichemiusli from Switzerland or? Is it a Swiss breakfast? Yeah, Bichemiusli, you know, the muesli. <laughs> I don't think so. You know, the one thing that is surprising about the president's schedule that I did learn from both. Uh, it's easy. It's easy. Much more easy. Well, no, not that it's easy. Here, one of the surprising things that I think all of us could do well to take a lesson from um, that I saw both with President Bush's staff and President Obama's, their schedules are lighter than you would expect. They're scheduled less than you would expect, but they're scheduled in like five minute increments. So it's hyper precise, right? Um, but it's not like they fill the whole day with like five minute meetings. They, there's actually big pieces of white space on their schedule. It's not, it doesn't start as early as you would think and go as late as you would think. And I think one of the reasons that White House schedulers have evolved to this surprisingly light way of scheduling, even though it's very precise and it takes the president's time is extremely valuable, right? Because it is like five minutes of the president's time is, is very, very valuable. Um, one of the reasons they've evolved that way is because everyone knows that the reality of life is that the schedule goes out the window, like stuff happens, meetings run over, crises pop up in the middle of the day. And that white space very often is what's more valuable than filling your day with scheduled meetings. And that was one of the things that I was most struck by in terms of like presidential scheduling when I was there. But I have and no idea what he eats for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta, well, maybe you gotta the, ask Michelle that. The, the one overarching theme of your professional life is leadership. And what is <clears throat> one thing that you learned about leadership during your time at the White House? Maybe one thing that you wouldn't have had on mind before? You entered. Yeah, that's that's a fair question, and I to be to be accurate with your statement. I mean, I you're right that it, it's been a career more or less defined by leadership, but not always the practice of leadership, right? Like I, I think I I got it wrong often enough as a practitioner of leadership that I was very interested in the study of leadership. Um, so I've been you know a practitioner, I've been observer, I've been an advisor, I've been you know a researcher, and so forth. So. Um, I've seen it from a number of different angles and, and really at the White House, you're a staffer. I mean, you're, you're, you're staffing the leader. You're not, you're not really into the leader thing yourself. You're staffing the leader. And with both presidents, Bush and Obama, you have the chance to sort of observe, you know, them as leaders, all the cabinet officials as leaders and so forth. So it's a really great observational educational opportunity. One of the things you saw with both presidents, Bush and Obama was they had sort of an instinctive feel and an evolved way of trying to get through one of the most, I think, vexing things about being 
a leader, particularly a really senior leader, which is that nobody wants to tell you the truth, right? Nobody wants to give you bad news. Everybody's sort of biased to tell you what you want to hear because everybody's a little bit like uneasy about the whole thing, right? And it's really hard for leaders to find people who are willing to tell them when they've got food stuck in their tooth or when they're doing something stupid, right? That's really hard and that's it's really valuable. So both of them had ways that were evolved of, of getting through that. With President Bush, he had, and we interviewed them in the course of writing our book, we interviewed both of them um, about leadership and asked them this question, like, what did you learn about leadership? And I had some sense from watching them, but it was interesting. President Bush said, I learned to ask questions. And his point was, if you ask an honest question, like a genuinely curious question, one, you're demonstrating ignorance, which is important because you're saying, look, you think I'm like this leader who has all these answers. I don't. I, I'm, I'm going to make a decision, but I don't have the knowledge. I don't have the answers. You're the expert. I'm asking you. So if you ask genuine, honest questions and you show interest in people with curiosity, and get them talking, it really will sort of unlock things. And so he, his answer was very simple. I learned to ask questions and he was very good at sort of asking more questions than he would make statements. With President Obama, a different version of the same thing, he would, and he was a little bit more professorial, if you will. Um, and so he, he, his approach was a little bit more deliberate, if, you, if that's fair. But so like he would come into a meeting and one of the first things he would do is try to disarm people. He would try to break through that feeling of like, eh, is there something I'm supposed to say here or whatever? And he had different ways of doing that. But one of them was to create space by just like throwing the hand grenade in the middle of the room and just blowing up the, the expectation. So he would come in and he would say things like, look, I know, I know the three options up for decision right now are like A, B, and C. But what if we did Z? And Z was like the zinger, right? It was like the thing nobody was expecting. It was like the, the harebrained, left field, crazy idea that nobody would dare say out loud. And he would say it because he knew that that was how you unlocked the group. You created space for people to like, okay, if it's, if it's okay for the president to say Z, I can say, you know, Q or whatever. Um, and so he would do that. The other thing he would do is he would sort of go to what I call the back row. So, cause like you have all of the, the cabinet officials and all the direct reports. So he would come into a meeting very often and be like, okay, I got my secretary and blah, blah, blah. But, but he would also like look over the heads of all the cabinet secretaries and he would go to like the person in the back row who was like, taking notes that taking notes for the person, taking notes for the cabinet, right? And like, he would ask them what they thought. And that person would be like, what? Me? You want to hear from me? And it was a way of saying like every voice, I want to hear from every voice in this room. Every voice is important. And moreover, it was a way of acknowledging what we know, which is that in most organizations, the best insights, the highest quality insights are the ones at the bottom of the organization with the most junior people. And yet all the decisions get made at the top. So one of the best things you can do is find ways to like surface those insights that are usually buried at the bottom with the most junior part of the organization. And he was very good at that. And he would be very deliberate about making that kind of effort. Very interesting. Yeah, I think this holds <laughs> really a good, um, a good insight for all leaders that you always have an open door for everyone in the organization so that information floats from the outside to the inside, to say so, so that you can make smart and informed decisions as a leader. And therefore, you must, must create um, a playing field where everyone feels they could contribute without uh, having the fear of being rejected. This is what I hear you say. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you really need those voices. And you need those voices to feel free to say the thing that most of us feel a little nauseous when we want to say it. What do you call this style, this leadership style? You as a, you know, executive coach yeah, it, and a coach yeah, it, You know, it goes by different names that, um, I think the, the word that you used earlier that, that 
isn't a bad one to start with is just humble leadership, right? Um, the, I think the more, you know, doctrinal term, which, uh, people use in different ways is, is servant leader, right? Leaders who believe that all the power and the knowledge and the wisdom and the efficacy is with the team, not with them. Um, leaders who believe that their job is not to be served, but to think about what the team needs and to serve them, to unlock, um, their capabilities. I, you know, different, different people will call it different things, but something in that kind of humble slash servant leader style. But, but how do you, how do you find the right balance between this humbleness, asking the questions, um, helping others to, to find their role and contribute versus making a statement and bring your ego into play where it is at, where it is needed. If, if we also think about personal branding, for example, in nowadays, um, in social media, it's all about making your voice heard. But if you ask questions all the time, then most likely the voice of the other person will be heard. So where is, or how can you balance between making a statement and asking a question? And, you, and you're right to bring that up because you need to. I mean, if you look at the empirical evidence, we don't, we don't generally follow humble leaders. We don't generally gravitate towards humble. We sort of do, but like we, we, we generally have a, we have a track record of being attracted to narcissistic leaders for better or worse. That that's the reality. And there's something going on there, right? We want to hear from our leaders and we want our leaders to have confidence. And that's partially why we have these hierarchical models of leadership, I think, is because there's some part of us collectively that is living in a complex, difficult world. And we're unsure of where we're going and we have questions and we want answers and we want somebody who's going to stand in front of us and be like, it's going to be OK. We are going to get there. There's a way. I think the way is there. Let's do it. We can do this. Right. And you you gravitate towards that. So as a leader, you have to sort of like walk this weird paradoxical tension <clears throat> of yes, making statements that exude a lot of confidence and yes, being very humble and asking questions and being curious and vulnerable and all of that. So how do you do both? Um, it's not easy. Uh, it is possible. It's sort of a learned thing. I think nobody does this instinctually. Nobody shows up and they're like, I'm going to be this weird blend of confidence and humility, arrogance and humility. I'm going to be, you know, most of us show up somewhere on that spectrum, but we don't bring both extremes. And yet that's what really, I think, powerful leaders are capable of doing. And I think one, one shorthand for people that are looking for a way to do that is when you're, when you're making the statement, make a statement about the vision, about the why. Right. Be bold, be decisive, be arrogant, be confident about the why, about the vision, because that's what people need. And that's sort of what they expect of the leader and back away from being confident about the how or even the what, because um, that's what other people want to own. Like they don't want you to give them the how they want to own the how. But they want to sort of be given maybe the why. And so. I think if you stick as a leader to being really confident when it comes to explaining the vision and the why, and then you be very deferential and, and humble with regard to the how, um, that's a good starting place, as good as any. I heard this interesting concept from Paul Sappho, and he said, strong opinions, weakly held. I really like that. So you it's go a great in way of capturing it. Yeah. Right? It, it seems like it plays into the same direction as you just said. Yeah, I like it. it. Does, but it also does. having having the having this confidence of making a, a bold statement um, and, and really get out and share that message. And then at the same time, staying open for the feedback and for everything that comes and uh, allowing this gap to be filled, not only by your thoughts, but also by other th other people's thoughts. It's interesting to, if you have both sides of the spectrum, this uh, might be a very effective way of communicating. Um, Jeff, you, you are at a different stage of your career at the moment, and you decided to become a philanthropic um, venture capitalist, and you focus on a very specific area, like first, 
first responders and people who are there to support others. It seems like logical if we look at your career, where you came from um, and what you did as a, as, a, as, a, as a soldier, but also given the idea that you became more and more successful over time, now that you shift your focus back to these people, what made you decide to start this venture fund? Yeah, and, and um, I'm glad you see it as logical. Um, that's reassuring. I, I actually, um, you know, have to give most of the credit to my two partners, um, Senator Bob Carey and, and Bob Nelson. The, the original idea um, that we were all sort of co-founders behind was to do better in the philanthropic space of giving back to people who risk their lives in service to us. That, that's the shorthand, right? And it was born out of this idea that, yes, there's been a lot of, of support <clears throat> and attention on this community, but it's mostly through traditional philanthropic charities and so forth. And, and that system doesn't always work well. And it's difficult, right? Because you have to raise money and then you give it away. And, and there's all these well-understood issues with that model. And yet we knew that there's this generation and there will be for generations to come of people who, for various reasons, they just serve in support and in service to us. Um, whether it's veterans or first responders, anybody that, that is serving their country or their community at high risk, they don't get paid a lot. They typically get forgotten. They suffer in, in ways that we don't. They bear much more burden than so do their families. And yet they don't really get much in return and they don't ask for much. So our idea was let's, let's find a new way of, of serving them in exchange. So what we came up with was risk and return. And that's um, the organization I co-founded with my partners and we generally operate a early stage um, uh, venture capital f firm. We're now on our second fund and we do a range of things. But the, the big idea is that like all venture capital funds, uh, we make a return and then we give 50% of all profits to our foundation, which then serves this mission. Um, and then to various degrees, we also do what people refer to somewhat as, as impact investing, um, where you invest in technologies that, that are directly serving this community. Um, and in our case, a lot of that's been focused on sort of the mental health needs of veterans and first responders. Um, we're very excited by that. Um, there's only so much of that you can do in private capital markets, right? Like there are, there are also drawbacks to doing impact investing. Um, so generally what we rely on is, 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 a, is a unique model of kind of traditional private capital investing in a very non-traditional way of profit sharing into a foundation that, that serves this community and this mission. Um, and what kind of what ideas are you looking for? What, what kind I'm of sorry? ideas are you looking for? What kind of ideas are you looking for? Okay. What kind of startup are you looking for? Right now, we're, we're looking at everything from things that directly address the risks these people face. And we've been very interested and focused on, like I said, mental health um, types of things. But we're also interested in what we see as the kind of the, the flip side of that same coin, which is human performance technologies, right? Because we think unlocking the understanding of the brain and neuroscience and human performance and human physiology, um, human group dynamics and so forth, all of that can be directed towards therapeutic and for people that are, you know, in need and, and perhaps suffering or the same technologies and understanding and science can be directed at kind of unlocking performance gains for for people that that um, are in everyday and normal walks of life, so we're we're very interested in that space. Um, and then we're we're we run across the range of of all things deep tech that uh, are important innovations for for general sort of um, societal resilience and so forth, like like a lot of venture capitalists do. What is a typical investor in your funds? 
Are these organizations, companies, private persons? Well, we, you know, we're very proud of our, um, our, our, you know, our team and our approach. So I think we attract some investors that are just looking for like all other, you know, early stage private capital investors looking for a good team with a good thesis and a, a good approach and so forth. Um, but we also attract, I think, investors who they care about the mission. They, 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 they agree with the mission. They agree with the need to kind of uh, take care of these people who take care of us and also to kind of invest in the future resilience, the future competitiveness of our societies. Because that can't be taken for granted, right? Like, yeah, they're, they're talking about society. Talking about society. What is about the appreciation in the society towards these people taking this risk? Like a Navy SEAL, like firefighters. You know, can you? Um, so first, first thing is, can you feel that? Is there a strong appreciation in the society? And when you compare this today uh, with like twenty years ago, has that changed? I, you know, I think we're getting more and more dependent upon these communities because I think the challenges to, um, you know, our, our environment and, and our communities just because of the volatility and the accelerating pace of change are growing. They're not decreasing. And so I think we're becoming more and more dependent upon these types of, of servants. Um, but I don't know that our appreciation of them is growing at the same rate. So um, I think we are, we're getting better at being aware that we should be appreciative, but I don't know that that always means that we actually follow through, right? I mean, there, the great example is, is um, whether or not people are signing up for these, these professions as um, kind of public service um, jobs. And I think even if in the back of people's minds, they're aware that this is becoming more and more important to kind of our fabric as a, as a society, you don't see, I think, huge amounts of people rushing into these professions. Um, so I think we could do better on that front. And I think that's one of the things we're trying to channel some energy into. And now, whenever I go to the United States, I feel like that the appreciation in the society, the acceptance of the army or, you know, or appreciation towards any service. Also, even if it's for kids, sports club, it's, it's, um, it's relatively high compared with other countries. I know it goes in cycles, right? Like, um, you would not have said that if you were visiting the United States post Vietnam war. Right. Um, and so in many ways, the moment we're in now is something of a reaction, I think, to an earlier era where we 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 undervalued um, those contributions and we're we're sort of the pendulum has sort of swung the other way. So I, I think you're right. It's uneven, but I think it also goes in cycles. And, and frankly, so, yeah. the pendulum will swing again. Right. Like it's not it's not a static dynamic. Jeff. What is one thing that we could support you with if we reach out to our community? Are you looking for leads um, for your deal flow startups in the in the performance field or mental health fields? Anything that you're in particular looking for? Yeah, no, I appreciate you asking, and and we are always very interested in talking to founders, entrepreneurs who are working um, in this space, who are looking for. Um, investors that, you know, like working with um, those types of founders. Um, we love those types of conversations and introductions. Um, obviously, as, as all firms do, uh, uh, we're very interested in talking to investors who um, are looking for, you know, kind of novel ways of doing uh, alternative investment exposure. Because uh, we certainly fall in that category, you know, where we we really try to get the balance uh, optimized between you know purpose based approach uh, that doesn't compromise on potential returns, and so um, you know that's that's what we're all about, and um, we're always interested in talking to those folks. 
Great. Thank you very much, Jeff, for your time. We talked about uh, your early career as a Navy SEAL and about your leadership principles you took away from that. We talked about your time at the White House and about uh, the breakfast of uh, uh, ex-President Obama. We talked about <laughs> <laughs> all the takeaways that leaders uh, can learn from you when it comes to communication of a bold message, a bold vision, and then leaving room for contributions of their teams or their um, co-employees. And uh, yeah, we just talked about your most recent venture, your own fund, uh, Risk and Return. And uh, as I said already in the beginning, it's always very inspiring to talk to you. Thank you very much for your time. Very much appreciated uh, sharing all these insights and messages with us. And uh, we wish you all the best for your recent endeavor. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thanks, Ole. Thanks, Fabian. Great to be with you. Thank you.